Getting more complicated every week. I have to wait until he gets something to get in here. Well, this morning we are going to give some attention to industrialism in relationship to the 21st century. I think we all realize that conditions are getting continuously more difficult and that we are faced with the immediate need for some careful planning. Without planning, we can be in serious trouble. Back in the 17th century, there was an old Jesuit priest who did a series of interesting illustrations of Noah's Ark. And Noah's Ark, in his eyes, uh, largely resembled a Hilton Hotel. <laughs> it had several different floors, each with proper rooms for all the various bipeds and quadrupeds. And on the top of it, in the most exalted spot, was a penthouse for Noah and his family. And they really had it fixed very nice. So they started out on this great sea of the uh, deluge in this wonderful boat. And we can't help but see a parallel to our planet. Our planet is like Noah's Ark, a vessel carrying life across a great ocean of space. This boat, in this case, is about 8,000 miles in diameter and supports hundreds of types of living things and thousands of minor varieties. This particular planet, surrounded by its magnetic fields and its various etheric zones, is isolated in a great ocean. There is no way in which the creatures upon this planet can really go anywhere else. And in spite of occasional rumors, there doesn't seem to be anybody, really, who wants to come here from anywhere else. <laughs> uh, we are more or less isolated, and we have a planet that has served us well. But at the same time, we are imposing certain mistakes upon the processes of nature, and we're getting into some trouble. It's one thing to have a planet in which we can all live together in peace, and quite another thing to have a planet large enough for us all to live together in constant conflict and competition. We are gradually exhausting the resources of our planet without knowing anywhere else to get other resources. We are hopeful perhaps of someday using solar energy for this or that, but for the most part, we are locked in this globe, floating in a sea of life and air, moving serenely and majestically around the sun, and bringing with it around a world of people, selfish, self-centered, egotistic, and indifferent to their own futures. It's time, I think, for us to turn from the heavy weight and thought of science to the common everyday common sense of trying to understand the problems we face and what it is possible for us to do about them. There's one thing that is obvious. In order to settle and solve our present dilemma and carry our future past the 21st century, we are going to be forced to discipline ourselves. We cannot live simply in a fun world. We cannot do anything and everything we please with no thought of consequences. We have only certain resources. Our planet is like a bottle. It has many interesting things in it and quite a supply of life energy. But the more rapidly we exhaust this energy, the emptier the bottle becomes. And it's already obvious that a number of empty spaces have appeared. Spaces that were once full of energy and possibility and now are exhausted and empty. So we must begin to think carefully about how we are going to live on this planet into the next century without an absolute uh, impoverishment of our resources and an impoverishment of our own way of life. Well, we can take a couple of examples of this problem and see how it looks. We'll take, for instance, 
the problem of gasoline. We know that uh, when we take a transfusion out of the human body, that we have to give that body a little rest in order to catch up and make some fresh blood. But when we take a con an infusion or take a con transfusion from uh, the planet Earth, we immediately come back for more of the same. We give it no rest, but we are dealing with a limited commodity, a commodity that must sometime be exhausted. The more carefully we use it, the longer it will last. But it is not repairable, and it cannot be restored, for it took millions of years to create and produce it. So here we are with a problem. Now we come along with an automobile. Now an automobile was originally a comparatively simple means to come getting from here to there. An automobile is now big business. It is one of the great industries of the world. And what happens? We are pouring gasoline into this car, and at the same time, the number of cars and the increase of buildings and cities and communities results in the fact that the power and speed with which we can get somewhere is rapidly diminishing. We must let the car run a little bit at least, so that we can keep up with things, while we can travel only five miles an hour. The cars are bumper to bumper, and I know of one case at least in which a family has to get up at four o'clock in the morning and start out at five o'clock for about a 15-mile trip to work, where they're supposed to get about eight o'clock. Now, this is not only a, an incredible situation, but a friend of mine who travels a great deal tells me that things here are comparatively simple. If I want to see real congestion, go to Mexico City. And if that doesn't quite please you, go to Iran and find out what is happening over there. And for that matter, try almost any European city. This traffic problem is becoming impossible. Yet we continue to produce about 10, 15 million cars a year we we'll continue to use gasoline without getting anywhere, and uh, we have practically lost the use of ordinary locomotion. Even now, a, a, fa a, mile, a mile or two is more than we can walk. All, all this adds up to the fact that we're getting into serious trouble. Now, one country has tried to avoid this trouble a very simple way. There are practically no cars in the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Soviet Union. The uh, people go on bicycles. They go everywhere on bicycles. The country is using its own human renewable energy to get from one place to another instead of exhausting the world's resources on fuel. This is something we must also give a little thought to. The problem of becoming aware of economy of natural resources. Another natural resource we're having trouble with at the present time is wood. We know that wood is a renewable agent, that it can be used and will grow again. But it, we're calling on it for more than it can possibly give us. On the one hand, we're topping down the forest as fast as we can for various wood products, especially paper. At the same time that we're doing this, we have had an outbreak of serious fires destroying many square miles of forestry. Also at this time, we have a number of real estate agents dividing up the remaining land to selling off a building and cutting down the trees. All this is happening in one great big conglomerate. How are we going to con uh, control this? How are we to reduce the need for this particular type of material? Are we using what we have of it wisely? Are we setting an example that can go into the next century and assure us that we will have proper forests and proper land for recreational purposes, that we will not be worried about running out of the commodities that we need? Well, we have all kinds of uses of paper. We also have the recycling of paper. But in fact, of everything, we have a tremendous the reduction of available timber. And one of the things that we are using it for very heavily is paper. 
Now, the uh, average family, I think, here, at least most of you, in the last month or two, have received a deluge of advertisements and catalogs and pamphlets and requests for one thing or another. These have gone through the post office and have blocked it so heavily and forced such an improvement of its facilities that we have to pay more of that now to send a letter than we used to do to send a heavy uh, package. So we now are using this paper, wasting it largely, tons of it, hundreds of tons of it, for advertising purposes. In newspapers, we put a whole page ad, and all that's on it is the name of the store and a picture of a pair of shoes. It could be just as well put on a quarter page or an eighth of a page. But if a full page is a tr more attractive, and the way result in paper, no one cares anything about. There are many, many ways in which we could conserve our natural resources of wood, that we could save a great deal on... Uh, the loss of our forestry by simply economizing on our use. Most of the material that is put on the paper is thrown in the waste basket within a few hours. There is very little of permanent value. It is not a world history that our descendants will read. It is simply in passing announcement put up by an advertising agency and filling a large amount of paper that thereby is lost as far as its permanent value to humanity is concerned. We must begin to conserve resources to have something for the 21st century. We must also do this in order that we may set an example for the future of that which is necessary to our own security and the perpetuation of our species. Education should definitely include instruction in the conservation of resources. And it is not too early now, in fact, it's pretty late, to introduce such educational procedures into our public school systems. We need people to realize the responsibility of use and misuse, that everything that we use is being taken from our natural resource, that this resource is isolated in space, that we cannot fill it at will, we can only use whatever survives, and every year less survives because of wastefulness. We are wasting too much natural resource, and it is going to come in the end to the fact that we are going to come to woeful want on these matters of which we are now ignoring. So we need to recognize all these basic factors. Now the basic factor of food is also another problem. At the present time, we are not eating to live. We are more or less living to eat. The world is either overfed or on the verge of starvation. There is no consideration for the proper use of food products. There is no recognition of the importance of estimating what the human being needs, making certain that he gets it without wasting thousands, millions of dollars worth of available food resources. We can take a very simple example of this. In the Scandinavian countries a few years ago, they began an experiment, an experiment in connection with grain. After all, grain is a basic food. So what do we do with it usually? We eat some of it, that's true, packaged and variously adulterated and variously inoculated with preservatives. But what do we do with most of it? We feed it to cattle. And by that means, we fatten the cattle. Then we kill the cattle and eat the meat. The Scandinavians have suggested, with perhaps considerable intelligence, that we just skip part of this process and eat the cereal ourselves, <laughs> and therefore not allow two-thirds of it go to fattening meat. We do not we save one single thing in the form of energy, because the animal gets the energy from the food it eats. If we eat the food first, we do not need the energy of the animal, and we can reduce one of our greatest sources of poor health, and that is over meat eating, which is one of the curses of the American public. We can therefore no longer find it necessary to keep these great herds or to make all these adjustments and maintain a great system of slaughterhouses. We can simply eat the cereal ourselves. 
Now this seems too simple. It must. It just can't be worked that way. <laughs> we can't do it that way. We have to fatten the meat. We have to do all kinds of things. And we have to set aside a large group of people to do nothing but murder animals. All of this is utterly waste. And the same thing is occurring to a certain degree in the African areas that are set aside as animal reserves. As soon as the reserve is set up, the poachers come in and try to kill the animals anyway. It is time that things of this kind be given proper consideration. Because if we do not give it this consideration, we're going to be in very serious trouble. Not only are we reducing the supply, but we are increasing the population. We are now faced with a problem that before the end of the 21st century, the population may well be close to twice its present size. With this additional population, we will have less land for the growing of vegetables, things of this nature. We will also have impoverished soil, overworked. We will have every faculty, facility that we have overworked in the effort to take care of these people. And at the same time, the supply of material to take care of them with is steadily diminishing. Now, unless we depend more and more upon material that reestablishes itself, we are going to be in a very, very bad way. Now, what is behind all of this? Well, it's what it's always been, the profit of problem of profit. We are thinking largely in terms of the profit on motor cars, not on the fact that they are gradually coming to a standstill because there's no way of moving them. We do not think particularly of the needs for certain paper or certain materials. We, know, we think only of the profit from it. We think only that all things on earth are available for sale and it is up to us to merchandise them. So we are now at problem with trying to merchandise the natural resources of the earth. We are trying to find ways to make profit on materials and substances and essences which are gradually diminishing, thereby becoming more scarce. The more scarce they are, the more expensive they will be. And we are gradually coming to a very serious dilemma. And unless we do something a little bit about it, we may even have trouble trying to tip ourselves into the 21st century in one piece. It is getting acute. It is getting to the point where some intelligence may, must take the place of the opinion that money is everything. It is not everything. There's a little story that kind of brightens this up of a group of people in Poland forming a line waiting to get into a meat market. The line has gotten longer and longer and longer. The store is still closed and the line is about three blocks long. At this point, the management of the store comes out and says, will the, the communist card-carrying citizens step out of line and come in? Well, there's nearly a riot. All the rest are about ready to explode. They're pretty nearly ready to start a civil war. Seeing the situation, the management comes out again and says, it is only fair that these card-carrying members should be, come in first. So, so that we can be the first to tell them and the first that will know that there isn't any meat for anybody. <laughs> well, we're coming a little close to this problem. It's not funny anymore. We are, population is increasing. Malnutrition is increasing. And from the de depletions of various problems and substances, crime is increasing. Degeneracy is in increasing. And reliance upon narcotics is increasing. All the things we don't want, we're getting more of. Because we're wasting the things we need, which are getting scarcer. There's only one way we can do this, and that is begin to grow up. Every individual who becomes an adult in the modern world, in any country, should be educated to the realization that we are castaways on a small ball in space. There is nowhere else to go. There is no other way in which we can outgrow this and move west as they did in 49 or move up to Alaska as they did in 98. We are here. Wherever we go, the same scarcities will prevail. 
Therefore, we have got to be prepared to live within our means. We've got to be prepared to use the values of our planet constructively and usefully, and we've got to create a commonwealth of cooperation instead of a battlefield of competition. It has to come. If it does not come, the powers that are greater than we are will turn this planet into a desert. We are not going to be allowed to break every law of humanity and every law of common sense, lose all sense of virtues and proprieties, and do this forever. The laws of nature are exact. The laws of nature are fair and honorable. They reward that which is good and they punish that which is bad. We have been bad so long that the punishment is near, and the best thing we can do is repent in time to try to put together this situation and get it back on its feet again. Therefore, it means that we have to do what the old Socialist Party told us long ago. Think in terms of production for use instead of production for profit. There will be a reasonable profit if we're intelligent, but there will no longer be this mass urge to double and quadruple your holdings in the first year. We will not be thinking in terms of a handful of millionaires, but in a, a nation or a world fairly well populated with contented people doing reasonably well according to their talents and abilities. We've got to gradually get over the fact that a system such as we have is only useful if there's some place to go when you wreck what you have. If there was another empire somewhere in a corner of the earth where we could start over again, it would be already filled probably, but there would be room for some more. But there is no other place. It's got to be done here. It's got to be done within a comparatively small area with a constantly increasing population. The only way that we can get together is to do it in a sensible and honorable and constructive manner. Another great, great waste of uh, potential materials, probably the greatest waste of all in nature, is war. War is completely impossible in this world such as we have without destroying that world. It is absolutely necessary for us to realize that we cannot take the decreasing natural resources and blow them up year after year, turning everything, everything that we have into war materials, then not even going to war with it, but allowing it to rot. We cannot continue to waste our resources on our animosities. We cannot continue to hate people and hope for the best. It will not work. And there should be a sufficient amount of intelligent people graduating from our various universities and already graduated, uh, leaders in various walks of life who should have the common sense to know that it is absolutely necessary once and for all to terminate warfare as a manner or matter of how to solve problems of international relationships. It cannot go on because we will in a few years, or can in a few years, blow up our entire load of natural resource. We can make this planet into a desert by using everything in it that is of value for warfare. And the warfare problem is not what really concerns most of them. The war problem is the profit on the munitions. Well, this profit is nothing but profit on the blood of each other and it has got to, got to be solved. But there is one of the great wastes of natural resources. The world is covered with the wrecks and ruins and skeletons of war materials. It is using most of the nuclear energy for purposes of defense. We're having trouble with these nuclear plants and we'll continue to have trouble because we are trying to use an artificial means of solving a natural problem. That is, as a family, we must fit our demands to the resources that are available. And with this kind of thought in mind, we have to go now to the second prong <coughs> of this problem, and that is distribution and merchandising. We have to realize that we are making a really a life purpose out of buying and selling. We have come to the conclusion that there's nothing worth living for except what we buy and sell. This is a really basic mistake. 
It means that the average person, a human being today, is more concerned with what he has than what he is. He is not interested in the improvement of his character. He is interested in the improvement of his wardrobe. But uh, actually, this wardrobe will do him very little good if he continues to overlook the growth of his own nature. Man is the most potential source of intelligent conduct. Man can, by the equipment which has been bestowed upon him, solve most of the problems that he faces. But he is not interested in solving problems. He seems to be interested in complicating them. If he has two suits, he wants a third. If he buys a necktie, he wants another one at three times the price. If he buys anything, he looks forward to its obsolescence. And in the tragedy of obsolescence, we have a new member of the group, a very important one, the computer. The computer admits now to take over most of the misfortunes and infirmities of the human race. Instead of being what it was hoped to be, a great step forward, it is going to be an intensive way of complicating our conditions. Unless somebody with intelligence takes over this thing and leads it in the way it should go, it will just end in a worse complex than the television, radio, motion picture, all of which were intended to help and have become simply instruments of commercialization and exploitation. So with these uh, tender thoughts in our minds, we must try to figure a little something to do about it. I would suggest the first thing, that we drop several different courses in the primary schools and put in a course that deals with the basic problem of citizenship. And citizenship not in the terms of politics, but citizenship in the terms of the fact that each child that comes into this world is a citizen of this world while he's here. That he has the opportunities the world can give him and the responsibilities necessary to protect that world. He should begin in his own education to conserve resources, to make do. Instead of throwing things away, correct them. Do everything possible to extend and perpetuate the resources that we possess. That it's not necessarily enough to plant a tree which will be cut down next year anyway, but it is necessary in personal life to live moderately, live as frugally as possible, and not fall victim to this continuous programming of, advertise of advertisements with which we are all afflicted. The time has come when the young people and the old I've got to realize that they are responsible for the survival of their planet. It is no longer what nation is going to dominate. We are surrounded by an empty, mysterious thing called space. Space always has dominated and always will probably. But we can keep our own existence longer, happier, and healthier if we keep the rules rather than trying to exploit every opportunity that comes along. Exploitation should be considered as a major crime. It is something that not only will injure the individual who is being exploited, but which will endanger the survival of the planet. We never think of planets as being in need of survival, but they are. And a planet is a very complicated thing. And what will happen if the balance of chemistry and minerals and so forth inside of a planet if this balance is destroyed by exploitation, by removing and, and wasting energies which the planet has been storing for ages, what will this happen? What will happen from as a result of such a condition? What will this be in terms of the, of the relationship between the sun and the earth? The sun has certain influence on the earth. The earth is dependent upon the sun. The magnetic fields of these various bodies are related to each other. And if we bankrupt the, ma the uh, magnetic field of the planet Earth, what do we have? We can have something that would slowly but inevitably die. Now, we like to think that inside of the human being there is a moral power. We like to think that man has a spirit or a soul. The ancients believed the planet had a spirit and a soul. It believed that if the planet was mistreated, it would fight back or it would get sick. Everything had a soul. 
And when that soul rules, there is normalcy. When that soul is disobeyed or destroyed, there is abnormalcy or subnormalcy. The planet to be healthy must be protected and maintained by the healthy cooperation of the creatures that live upon that planet. And as man is the leader of these creatures, he must set the example for the rest and help all the other forms of life to cooperate with nature in the fulfillment of its own purposes. Unless we do this, we have no heritage to hand on to anybody. We will have nothing but a moral bankruptcy finally resulting in the physical decay of the planet. We cannot break the rules without the rules breaking us. And it is very high time to take this into very grave consideration. We must watch in merchandising not to repeat and to go into competition on the same products. We must also be very careful to get over the idea of putting the life length of a product as short as possible in order that we may sell another one of the same. We have to recognize that it is our moral duty to see that the various products, to coffee pots or percolators or whatever they are, last as long as possible. Because every time a replacement is necessary, a material that cannot be replaced has to be taken from nature's storehouse. And if we keep doing this one day of the days, we're going to find, like Mother Hubbard, that the cupboard is bare and there is nothing more that we can take out. So we should be very careful and thoughtful not to throw away that which is good and useful simply because of some passing mood of style not wasting our funds upon things which neither help, improve, nor really satisfy anything, but to keep in possible uh, within the range of reasonable uh, activity and reasonable replacement. If we do this, we will help to keep the, the planet uh, as full of natural resources as possible. We can't prevent them all from being, uh, from uh, some loss, but we can help to make those losses minimal. Now this presents us with another phase that we have to consider, it seems to me, and that is what to do with what we don't want. This becomes the problem of how to get rid of waste. The uh, present situation is, pr is noticeable in practically every community in the United States and in most other countries. The stacks of rubbish reach almost to the moon, and there are some who would like to put it there, but it's not very practical at the moment because of the problems of transportation. But at the same time, we have to handle the problem of waste. We try to bury it, we take nuclear waste and put it in kegs and drop it in the ocean. We do everything we can, particularly with the nuclear waste of both industry and militarism. But here we come against something that is really serious, that most of the nuclear waste that we're trying to dispose of cannot be disposed of that way. We can't get rid of it. We can only consider the need to find a cure for it if this is possible. And instead of many of the research programs that are now going on, which bring very little to anybody, Somebody should get seriously interested in what to do with the nuclear problem. And until we are able to find a proper answer, either discontinue the processes or else reduce them to an absolute minimum. There should be a, the first of all, that never again will nuclear materials be used in warfare, never allowed to be used in any form except where it is, can possibly perhaps to produce light or help some way to advance civilization. And even then, with the greatest reserve and the first consideration being to use such powers as can be dis controlled or can be found and used or, if necessary, can be discontinued, whereas the nuclear energy problem is as yet unsolvable. But we still go on making the problem. We still continue trying to do something with no good consideration for what happens afterwards. This slips into also into many fame forms of industry. We have industry everywhere, which is dumping dangerous waste into our water supplies, into our rivers and our lakes, destroying our fish and marine life, and polluting the oceans. 
Now, doesn't anybody realize that this is serious? Do we want to continue making legislations to permit this to continue against the better judgment of enraged citizens? What are we doing with pollution? Now, pollution is of two kinds. You know, every living thing must cause a certain amount of pollution. We know that. But there is a natural pollution problem and an artificial one. The natural pollution problem, the natural problem of, the, of, of handling the dis, disposition of natural waste from the bodies of living things, all this has been taken into consideration by nature. And all natural wastes can be handled by nature without great danger to anyone. It is the unnatural wastes that are the things that nature cannot and does not handle. It also does not handle a useless or thoughtless wastefulness which creates a pressure upon natural facilities. The natural wastes of the of living things since the dawn of time have not damaged the planet. In fact, they have produced a great deal of the wealth of the planet. But the nuclear waste that we are developing now can destroy everything in a, comparative, in a comparatively short time. The time has come very definitely where this must be curbed, where it must be handled. And again, it is a matter of the individuals becoming more intelligent as they come to the end of this century. The citizen of tomorrow, the young people we hope will take over after the beginning of the next century, should be educated and trained to understand what is dangerous and what is not dangerous. They should be thoroughly prepared to dedicate their lives and their thoughts to the prevention of unnecessary waste, unnecessary evil, and of always, of utterly and eternally unnecessary conflict and war. These young people must realize as they come in that competition is not the life of trade. It is the death of trade and the trader as well. Out of a world struggling in wars and rebellions and political uproars all the time, worse every day. We are developing an idea that sometime one of these nations or some of them will win and the others will give in and peace will set in. This is a, a false hope. This confusion will continue until individuals recognize that brotherhood and friendship will contribute to survival and hatred and war will contrib contribute very rapidly to the complete disintegration of the planet. We have no longer the right to destroy the future as well as ourselves. We should pass on this world to this world of tomorrow, uh, a world as good as we found it. And when the last century began in 1901, we had a planet that was comparatively livable. It had its problems, it had its mistakes, it had had its false geniuses, but the individuals of that period had a reasonable chance of growing up, establishing homes, and doing a day's work. We are now passing on a generation, a century, of constant conflicts, of the worst wars in the history of mankind, of the greatest financial depressions recorded. We had to hand on the results of a dismal lack of common sense. We have completely forgotten the purpose of life. We are convinced in our own funny little way that we are simply here to enjoy ourselves, that we are not responsible to anybody for anything except to do as we please, and that it is the proper right of everybody to do what they please even though it injures others as long as it satisfies them. So this type of thinking has brought us to probably the worst crisis in the history of mankind. Now, nature is not very kindly to this type of attitude. The individuals who are wrong, if they're in the minority, they go through the little punishments that they have earned. But when whole nations, races, and vast areas become subjected to false thinking, then we have nature stepping in with very great and important changes changes that we will not like, changes that will make us very unhappy unless we prevent the need for them. We cannot go on, they are now going, 
any more than we can continue indefinitely on cocaine or heroin. It may, may, we may feel like a million dollars now, but we will be very sick very soon. And that is the thing the world is catching up to and beginning to realize. There is an undercurrent now of people who begin to know that the way we have been doing it is wrong, and they are working to do it better if they can. So for those people, and for all of us, I think we should establish a definite system of learning based upon the place of man on a planet that he cannot get out of. He's here. He is not going to leave here. If somebody comes from another planet, he might look forward with a little hope, but his hope will be dashed because anybody smart enough to get here will probably be too smart to allow him to move in on them. <laughs> So we are likely to be here, and we might even be under stress from the colonizing of planets that have been more sensible than we have. But in any event, we are here, and we are building a new generation, and we have already some six million people, uh, six billion people to work with, and there will be probably eight or nine billion by the end of the next century. There will be as many more as is necessary to maintain the progress of humanity in terms of the propagation principle. But we are here to do something to make this place safe. The earth could handle or can take, could take care of 25 million if these people live together in peace and in amity. We could take care of many times as many as we have if there were people out to exploit everything and everyone. If we were uh, willing to live moderately and would be willing to uh, share our joys and sorrows with others, we could go on indefinitely. But as each individual remains a rugged individual, we were going to have very serious collective consequences. The uh, individuals who will not work together will be the victims of their own lack of integrity. Now, we have been given religions and philosophies to help us to see these things. We have been taught the importance of brotherhood. We have been taught the reality of integrity. We have taught the wisdom of unselfishness. All these things we have taught, are taught, and in many religions they are still being taught. But the great motion of civilization goes on the same. Just to do as we please, make all we can, and then depart. And when we go, we, leave not, we need take nothing with us. But if we continue as we are, we'll leave nothing behind either. We are completely wrong in our entire assumptions of realities. Suppose we imagine that we came into this world, into a world of people who respected birth, who respected children, who respected the family and kept the nobility and integrity of family. Suppose these children were brought up to respect their parents, to obey the laws of society, and to prepare themselves to make a useful contribution to the perpetuation of an honorable system. They could be taught the things that they need to know. A good system in school could help them. No one should be able to graduate from high school, certainly, without realizing the importance of cooperation above competition. We should know these things as parts of life, but they are carefully removed for the from the curriculum because they will interfere with the progress of our economic structure. We are concerned only with money, which we cannot take with us, and if they finally destroy the planet, and it becomes a dead world, the money will be among the ashes of the dead and nothing of what we have. The only thing we might say that we have is what we have learned, what we have understood, and the kindness and goodness of our hearts. These things we can take with us, perhaps, but we cannot take with us any of the problem things that are disturbing us and destroying us today. So suppose we now start in with some kind of a basic concept that we can apply. We can apply to mature people and to young people growing up. There should be some way in which every human being, 
can become aware of his normal responsibilities in life. To graduate a person with nothing on his mind but his own career is a crime to start with. It can only produce greater misery than we had before. And to have a world of people, each one of whom is happy to exploit somebody else, is not worthy of humanity. We are not as wise as the ants and the bee. We are not using the faculties that we have been endowed with. We are not using the powers which nature gave us to help us to think. We all have minds, but we use these minds only as part of a system of exploitation. If we have a brilliant mind, we go into the profession and start cheating people on a little higher level. The so-called highly skilled, highly intellectual person may have absolutely no regard for the perpetuation of the integrities of life. So somebody's got to get in there and start teaching it. And it would be better to do it, do it before the beginning of the next century if it can be started. It should be included in every university. It should be part of the curriculum of every high school that each child should be taught that citizenship is a privilege that must be earned, is a dignity that must be maintained, and that it is a dream of future growth and future happiness for others that must be fulfilled by the consecrated labors of those alive today. There is simply no way in which we can get through this in any other manner successfully. We look also to see why various governments on various levels have been experimenting in the last 50 years. And we find that it is gradually coming back to this that the government cannot create an honorable citizenry. You cannot politically elect the right person. If he's any good, he will be disposed of. If he's no good, everyone will be happy and re-elect him, <laughs> simply because he will be catering to them. He will also be catering to something beyond himself. He will be catering to some great social structure which is itself a cause of trouble. He may be consecrated to the concept of wealth, which is one of the heaviest burdens a human race must bear. Or he may want to have no one have anything, which is also a very unpopular belief. But the actual fact is that this is a system World humanity is a system within the great system of evolution. Humanity is part of a great world cause, a part of a great ladder of growth that leads from the low, lowest to a higher level than anything we can even comprehend. We are all here to grow, we are all here to improve, we are all here to make something better for all of us. So if we settle down very frankly, cut out the long words, cut out all the intricate formulas, and sit back quietly and think in terms of the fatherhood of a divine power and the brotherhood of humanity, we can get something done. This brotherhood of humanity, we hear about it constantly, but the brotherhood is usually limited to a small area which we regard as our relations or our national racial relations. Brotherhood doesn't mean to take in the stranger. Brotherhood does not mean to, to be gentle to the faiths of those who differ from us. Actually, we have come, come to a point where we can no longer spend our time assailing the convictions of other people. We are going to have to learn to find things we can believe in common. And if we find them in common, they will work together. There is a little chapel in, outside of Jerusalem in which there are various statements of different religions as to the purpose of religion. There's a, there are similar ones in Asia. The answer to the whole thing is that all religions teach harmlessness, teach brotherhood, teach integrity, morality, and ethics. They teach the individual to find resources within himself, to deepen his insights, to enrich his understanding, and to make him a better citizen. Every religion has the same basic teaching. In every religion, practically, the golden rule is found almost word for word. And all these things, the people who have these same beliefs cannot get together. Something always has to divide them. Not the essential, 
They are not divided by the statement, thou shalt not kill. They are divided by all kinds of little personal petty grievances, by all kinds of sectarian divisions, which are of comparatively no value any more than the divisions within the economic system will ever produce comfort, peace, or wealth for civilization. We have got to get to the basics. We've got to get to the point where we can get together and they'll solve these problems or they're going to keep coming to us day after day. Now, if you've passed out of the period where it's likely that you're going back to school for any reason, then you find maybe that you don't have to do it that way. Actually, the greatest instruction that any of us can have comes from within ourselves. If we will open the area between the outer and the inner life, if we will see a channel, not with some spirits, but channel with ourselves, channel with our own soul, get the message of our own inner life, we will realize that no human soul is completely evil. All souls are essentially divine. All souls are naturally the instructors of minds and of bodies. And if we can go inside of ourselves a little bit, we will nearly always find a kind of gentle wisdom, a simple truth, a realization that when we hate, we suffer. The realization that friendship is better than enmity, that to be truthful is better than to prevaricate. All these things we know inside ourselves. Either our own or childhoods or in earlier uh, generations of our families, we have been church people. We have had training. We have a broad acceptance of religious values. And yet every day, a world with more than four billion people who believe in God, this world acts as though there never was a God and never will be. It is something that we have never put to work, never done anything with it. We keep on holding it, and on Sundays we agree with the preacher. But the rest of the week we do exactly what we've always done. And this is the type of thing that nature will not permit. Nature will never give us a larger planet to live on till we live on this one well. We will never escape from the trials of the day uh, to some kind of peace as a result of a platitude. In order to escape from the small, we must become greater. In order to escape from a small planet to a larger one, we must deserve this. Not to run away from the exile we are in somewhere on the edge of, play, of space. Mark Twain always referred to the earth, the earth as the wart, uh, the, on the side of a pickle. It was something that somewhere almost overlooked. They had a hard time finding the planet in the Mark Twain story of Stormfield's Trip to Heaven. It, a parody, yes, but it was a very stinging one, and a very bitter one in some ways, but very thought-provoking. Actually, we are here to find the common way in which we can make this planet work. We spend time and time to try to find out how to improve an engine. But we've got to learn to try how to, how to save a planet. We've got to do something to make certain that we do not exhaust the resources of the globe on which we live. It is like a bottle. It is filled with potential resources which we are permitted to use in moderation. But when all countries become oil conscious, when all countries begin to mine for coal, gradually this particular overlapping of things results in danger. But the countries involved will probably say they need the coal. So this becomes a problem. The problem remains to find out who needs and who wants. And these can be two very different things. What we need, we must find ways to get. What we want, we must variously arbitrate to protect the good of all of us. So we have in merchandising now also new mergers. Gradually it will go on until perhaps all markets will be owned by one company, all banks by one company. These enormous mergers, these tremendous buys and sellings in terms of billions, all these are very formidable and very tremendous but they are all really shadows. 
They're all little dreams that will probably end in trouble for all of them. This tremendous determination to, to leave the world uh, uh, or leave, when we are richer than we are now, that world, we will leave the world more wealthy because we have worked very hard and it damaged many people in order to accumulate what we have. And yet in the fact of the matter is, this type of life leaves us poorer than we ever were before. If we leave this world as nothing but the president of a merger, we are bankrupt. Because that merger means nothing anywhere else but here. And when our coal and uh, oil disappear here, and the planet is no longer livable, it'll mean nothing here. It is not the end of anything. We've got to learn that the road of progress is in and not out. We've got to learn that real growth is the fulfillment of our inner lives, lives that are not concerned with wealth, but concerned with understanding, with insights, with faith, with hope, and with love. We cannot do all the things we want to do on a little planet where we can do everything that we should do on even a smaller planet. It isn't the size of the planet. It's the soul of the individual. And nature is trying to tell us this. It is permitting us to go one step in after another into bankruptcy. It is proving to us every day that we are doing it wrong. It will prove to us every day that what we are believing in is not right. And yet we continue to force, we continue to determine to break the rules and achieve a happiness that is reserved for those who keep the rules. So if we don't know where we're going to go when these resources are finally exhausted, by the time we have done what we should have done, we will know where we go. And we will also know that we are going to have a better life than we've ever known before. If we want to outgrow the planet, so that we cannot perish with it, then we have got to outgrow the inner impulses to negation, enrich the consciousness of the realities of things, and even while we're here, actually live in the broad sunlight of a larger world. If we can outgrow this planet, we can go forth, enjoy freedom and fullness of spiritual maturity. If, however, we seem to be kicked out for our mistakes, that is a very sad mistake for us. It is something that shouldn't happen. It should never be anything for this planet except that we graduate. And we graduate when we keep the rules, learn to love the rules, and know that those rules are right. And until this happens, we're not going to graduate. And we can stay and fail the cause 50 times until perhaps finally the planet itself could no longer support us. But if we are really human, the planet Earth is a, is a, is a uh, place of rest, a caravansary, a place where we pause for a little while in the t great pat journey of life. And we can make it a very pleasant place. We can have gardens and friends and all of our beautiful flowers and pleasant homes we can live well, live quietly, live kindly, and live to grow. We don't have to stifle ourselves with my mortification of the flesh or something of this nature. All we have to do is to appreciate the right and live according to it. If we know that we have a friend, we are richer than, we, than to know that we have a half a dozen landlords. We want to have a relationship that will enable us to get out of this world without pain without sorrow, without regret. And in order to do that, we've got to start to live right here while we are here. The, if there is the kind of heaven that some people look toward, that heaven is a reward for right action. It is not something that is theologically conferred. It is something that is earned. We find that clearly na named and described in the scriptures. Therefore, we are constantly aware that there is a good that we should do and a constant tendency to do that which is not good. So each person can find another world, a better world, a world of beauty, 
a world of art, a world of great literature and music, a world of honest work, cheerfully and honestly done, of taking care of little children so that they laugh and sing and learn to grow up to be decent people. All kinds of things to do, all kinds of work that must be done. And it's all good if the soul is within it and behind it. If we live from the inside, there's no danger for the 21st century. But if we continue to press an outside that never was any good, we will pass on to the future a terrible heritage of shortcoming and failure. We will discover that we are not achieving what we were intended to achieve. So we want now to think a little bit also about the immediate way in which we can do something about uh, our economic system. One of the things that we can definitely do is to stop vanity spending. Now, stopping spending for vanity purposes may seem to be a hardship, but we can reduce all our needs to that which is reasonable, and we can escape from the continual pressure of advertising, which is forcing things upon us. We can admit, that actually, that the various forms of entertainment in television and so forth are not good forms of entertainment. Therefore, we do not need to fall back on them because there's nothing else to watch. It was much better for each individual to select something that will help him or her to be what they would be if they could, something that would help them to grow, to unfold their own ni natures and lives. Creative self-expression is much better than listening by the hour to canned music or canned dialogue. It is the individual moving from his own inner resources that must save the planet from the waste of natural resources. We must move the entire concept of perpetuation away from the planet and to the heart and soul and mind of the dedicated person. We are all safe as long as we do right. But we are not safe if we compromise or become over-influenced by the delinquencies of others. We are now on the verge of a great, another great electional conflict. Many people are going to be very unhappy and are already because of the way all these things are happening. That the only thing that the person can do at this time is to vote according to the best that he can decide of these combatants. But the time must come when it won't be done this way. The time must come when the individual who is the most meritorious will be so recognized and established. It cannot be done by this particular means because the means are not according to nature. We cannot uh, for solve these problems politically, but we can solve in our own minds the meaning of them. We can say to ourselves, I now see what is wrong, and I see how it could be made right. I see what it is that we have to do. And if we continue to think this way, we will discover that the thing that each of us has to do is to release the higher content of our own lives. Man is not simply a, an animal on its hind legs. Man is a creature that has the capacity to solve problems, whereas most of us use our mental uh, energy to create problems. We do not use them to make the problems less. So it is necessary for us to think in terms of releasing ourselves from a little ball floating in space. There is no way out physically, but there is a way out internally. And as we go along, we will discover that we come closer to freedom with every step towards the source of ourselves. That we can never be happy by being selfish, but we can be happy when the soul achieves a victory over the mind and the body. And we are here like the mystery schools of antiquity. We are here to be tested. In the old days, when a person wanted to be a scholar or a scientist or a physician or a judge, he was tested. He was subjected to certain trials and temptations and tribulations to prove his integrity. He was not elected by a ballot. He was achieved by means of his own inner strength. If he survived the tests and trials and proved worthiness, he then received whatever reward he sought. 
and it is the same in the way today. This world that we are living in is a sort of purgatorial sphere, a place of purging, a place of purification, a place of dedication to something better. We are here because of our own imperfections and to be reminded of them. But we are not here to become blind to them. We cannot be made to see, but nature has a way of making it very uncomfortable for us if we don't see. So instead of nature pointing a finger and saying, you shan't do that, nature creates a situation and rewards it with a war or an earthquake or an epidemic or something of that kind to tell us that we're not doing it right. And nearly every calamity of civilization is finally traceable to human misunderstandings. The impossibility, apparently, of man exercising his sense of humility and humanity. Actually, therefore, we are working constantly to pay off the debts of ignorance. In ignorance, we have built something that can't last. In ignorance, we are propping it up to the last bitter moment. And in ignorance, it's going to fall in spite of us. And after it's fallen and we get a quiet look, we will be glad it happened. We will realize that never will we be able to again be deluded into the types of mistakes we are making now. We have to outgrow our mistakes by going through them. So in that every day, start in a little bit in your various fields of life by thinking in terms of cons conservation of resources, thinking in terms of sharing ideals and dreams, thinking in terms of cooperating with those who are attempting to do a good job, and most of all of realizing that this is a testing ground for souls. We can't always make a great victory. Some of the best people who have ever lived have gone quietly and silently to a grave, unrecognized and unrewarded. But this is not important. A reward from here is worthless. The individual who has done it right goes forth into a better world than the rest of us have ever known. And we can do the same thing in civilization. If we look forward to a paradise resulting uh, from a good character, we can also look forward to an earthly Garden of Eden made beautiful because we have lived a good character. Everything that might reward the soul after death can also reward the mind and the body here if we do it. If we do not do it, then we will be plagued on in, in both levels at the same time. So in the industry, we all need a job. Leisure is an, an, an enemy to all progress. The individual hopes he can work until he doesn't have to work. If he doesn't have to work because of proper advance of age, that is one thing. But he, because he can retire on his millions is the worst disaster that can happen to him. The moment he ceases to yearn after something better, seeks to improve the quality of his daily life, when he ceases to do this, his value to himself and everywhere else uh, is lost. So we, we do know desperately and definitely that we are now counting our blessings and we're kind of drawing a will. We're making a document of what we are going to leave to our descendants. Our descendants, in this case, being those living in the 21st century. To them, we do bequeath this, that, and the other thing. At the moment, we bequeath a world in complete trouble. We bequeath wars, pestilence, crime, narcotics, alcoholism. We bequeath constant dissemination of false doctrine. We bequeath a materialism staggering under its own mistakes. And we bequeath an unfinished job which we have more or less miserably failed to keep. This is what we did bequeath to the future, a disaster. Now this doesn't have to be. We've got some years, about 10 or 12 years now, to begin to wake up. It's not bad to give the future a job. It must do the things we cannot do, but it can be given strength and integrity to do the right thing by receiving encouragement and inspiration from us now and from those who come after us who will help to see that the world knows that we have tried 
and that though we may not have succeeded, we are handing on something that is a, a positive contribution to the future. We would like those of the 21st century realize that we have dreamed of them, hoped for them, built for them, and hope to give them a better life and a better world than has come to us. We have these rights, we have these privileges, and we also know that we must watch very carefully the young children coming up today. Today the children that are being born, or have been born in the last few years, are going to inherit the burdens that we have created. It is our duty, therefore, not to shunt them around, or not to regard them as impossible interferences with our personal liberties, but to realize that they are an opportunity. They are the gift that we can give to the future by preparing them for a better way of life. We should constantly be thinking now of what we can give to those who come after us and not to what somebody else has done to us. And we are not any longer capable of solving our problems just by saying we're solving them. We must give most of these problems to the future, but we can also give the future the peace and understanding to realize that we have known the facts. We are trying to do something about them. We are laying a foundation upon which to build something stronger and better, and we pass on to them an unfinished work, but a work which we have definitely dedicated our lives to fulfill. In this way, we can do something that is more important than leaving them a Rolls Royce or something of this nature. We, can know we give them no good when we bestow upon them the power to do nothing. Any child who is finds that it's so endowed that it doesn't have to work, doesn't have to think, and doesn't have to grow. That is the underprivileged child. That is the one whose life is a tragedy. But if we make it possible for young people to get an idea of what lies ahead and realize the solution to the problems of today, and that the solution does not come from legislation, it comes from intuition, from conscience, from the inner faculty of the individual. We have within ourselves a soul that has languished for a long time. It is now our privilege and opportunity to bring it forth and make it the leader of our daily conduct and the leader of our lives in the years that lie ahead. If you will consider these things and do them, you will find that we have a very, very good future. Actually, therefore, industry, if we think of it, is work. Industry is the way most people make a living. This is perfectly proper, but industry must be cleansed. It must be redeemed. It must be fair. It must not be exploited. Industry must be cooperative to see that those who need have what they need in a reasonable way. Industry is not a war. It is a message way of sharing. Industry makes things available to us that we might never otherwise be able to have. But it also is responsible to do this with conscience, with integrity, with a spiritual realization that the dignity of selling and buying is just as great as any other form of dignity. If we buy fairly and sell fairly and keep the rules of life, and use our money as a convenience, as I said the other day, and not a, a fact in itself. It is a convenience, not a commodity. If we realize this, all the things we do now would become part of growth. Everything that we now present would help us to grow. It would give us the strength to get rid of what we can't use and give us the strength to cherish what we can use. It can help us to be a bet better people and prevent us from wasting the resources on which the next generation must build its home here on this planet. So uh, industry has got to conserve resources. It's got to prevent uh, the pollution of waters, to prevent the destruction of earth. We are here now gradually changing into a vast refuge pile a pile which contains not only the waste of civilization, but the waste of our dreams, of our hopes, and of our aspirations. 
uh, actually our inner life is not so different from the outer life with its constant negative pressures. So we want to get all this out of the way. Nature will protect us when we do it right. Nature will take care of the waste if we will use the products correctly. If we will refrain from any product that is destructive, we will dispose of most of our negative and dangerous wastes. Everything we do right will redeem some part of the difficulties of the civilization under which we live. We, we do it right, our own soul grows. We come and go, and we are blessed in the coming, and we are blessed in the going. All things will be better for us, and because of the dreams and ideals we have strengthened in our own nature, each one of us can make some contribution to the betterment of the rest of the world. That's it. <laughs>